Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from March 6th to the 12th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos and there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself. Now, I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. Now take these few stories with a grain of salt because we've seen marijuana moment and we've seen investment firms be wrong based on their predictions. However, just wanted to share this because it builds off of the clip I shared in my last week's video of Weldon Angelos highlighting that we might see a bill unveiled by the end of March. Um, and so this comes from Marijuana Moment in their newsletter as of March 9th, highlighting what we heard last week, uh, which we like to hear, Senate. Banking Committee Chairman Sherrod Brown and Senator Cynthia Loomis are reportedly planning to co-sponsor cannabis banking legislation that could be unveiled this month. Now, keep in time, or sorry, keep in mind, it will take time to pass this bill. But even for for them to introduce it and create the buzz that they're going to try and gather the votes and potentially hold a vote and eventually pass it and finally take the action that they've been delaying for so long, it does make us optimistic, a little bit more hopium as we continue carrying forward. But with that, I wanted to share these snippets from investment firms. So again, take them with a grain of salt because they've been wrong in the past, but they. I do highlight a simple fix, coal memo 2.0, replace coal with Garland. And there you have it, business as usual as prior to when Jeff Sessions rescinded this memo. And safe news flow could boost stocks in the second half of 2023. And so uh, just leaving this here, take from it what you will if you wanted to pause to read, but this is what Cantor sees based on the new developments that we've recently heard. A bit of context if you're not familiar with the Cole Memo. It was written by former AG under Obama, which basically protected legal cannabis businesses in legal states, whether medical or adult use, from the federal overhang. And at the same time, that might have given investors the safe harbor to invest, feeling that if cannabis businesses couldn't be harmed by the feds, then anyone investing in cannabis also couldn't be harmed by the feds. So that's why we're hopeful that we might see the Garland Memo uh, revisited and we could see business as usual before Jeff Sessions rescinded it in 2018. Um, a little bit more from Cantor. Uh, this is the snippet that we just saw in the last video, but there's more. So thank you, Dennis Ruda, for sharing a little bit more if you wanted to read through. So regarding safe banking, timing, regarding the likely process, as well as potential in Germany, um, unveiling and you know keeping their words, saying that they would introduce adult use legislation uh, via regular order. The Senate would start politics, Senate Democrats, Congressman Dave Joyce, or even just for the headlines. And so try to think of Canada, if you were not around for that, um, when we announced the plan that we were going to even legalize, that was the catalyst. And that's when all the money flew in and the hype went to crazy levels where these Canadian LPs were making 10 million for medical a quarter, uh, but they were valued at 15, 20, 25 billion at their peak before we passed the bill into law October, 2018. And then share prices only fell from down there. So, you know, imagine they introduced the bill, that's the catalyst, but you want to sell just before they pass the bill. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but I'm certainly going to be playing this a lot more carefully than, uh, than I have in the past, um, you know, just being lenient and waiting to see how things play out. So a bit more on the Cole memo too, if you wanted to read descheduling or rescheduling, we're generally more pessimistic on this front for now, as I am as well, as the more you dig, finds it might not be as easy as, as a lot of these people are claiming, or a lot of these congressmen and lawmakers are claiming. Uh, and then the last bit you can pause to read here. But on that point, uh, Rep Blumenauer led a group of 16 members of Congress in sending a letter calling on Biden administration officials to provide transparency about a review of cannabis's scheduling status that they're conducting. So, oh, nice, another letter. What a great effort. Again, you know, talk is cheap. We want to see action. But main thing I'm sharing this Tom Engel highlighting that we're seeing efforts made. Again, a lot of talk, little action. Action, although you could say sending a letter is action, but I wanted to share this point from Logic Prevails because it seems he did some digging and it brings up some good points because again, despite what we're being told, um, or is the reality different? And so Tom Engel, this is from March 8th, knew the Health and Human Services Secretary Xavier Becara sent a brief letter updating members of Congress about his department's ongoing review of cannabis scheduling status, but said that the Drug Enforcement Administration will make the final call. Wait, what? Then why are you calling on the HHS or the DOJ to try and do this when it's up to the DEA in the end? So DEA's role in the review process is nothing new, though. The mention by Becerra seems to acknowledge that descheduling is off the table. DEA's response to a rescheduling petition in 2016 explains specifically why it cannot legally deschedule cannabis. And so it's just you know, kicking the can back to each other. So annoying. Although the HHS evaluation and all other relevant data lead to the conclusion that cannabis must remain in Schedule 1, <laughs> 
horseshit. It should be noted that in view of United States obligation under international drug control treaties, cannabis cannot be placed in a schedule less restrictive than Schedule 2. This is explained in detail in the accompanying document titled Preliminary Note Regarding Treaty Considerations. And so thank you, Logic Prevails, for doing this digging. Now, I could be wrong. I'm just trying to share what I think is relevant to what we're also seeing in Congress, again, based on a lot of talk, what can actually get done. And so if you know more about this, please do uh, comment below. But main thing, just to share a little bit more. While some have suggested the U.S. could simply choose to ignore international uh, drug control treaties, the CSA specifically forbids violating international obligations as a matter of U.S. law. Of course, note that in 2020, international control of cannabis was relaxed but not eliminated. So you can read a little bit more here. Cannabis is a drug listed in the single convention. And the single convention uses the term cannabis to refer to marijuana because that's what it is. Cannabis should have been using that word all along. So you can pause to read through it, but summarizing, therefore, in accordance with Section 811, yada, yada, DEA must place cannabis in either Schedule 1 or Schedule 2. That sounds like shit. And so there's a bit more here if you wanted to pause to read. But main thing, again, I don't know all of the details. Just trying to bring this information to you if you're interested. So a little bit more. See the DEA's 2016 letter and description of treaty considerations as a binding factor in any rescheduling review. Um, and so this link will be below in the descriptions if you wanted to read. Now, I wanted to bring this question up because it's fair. How was Canada, Mexico, Thailand, and Europe legalized adult use cannabis then? Are none of them part of this international treaty? Um, they are not bound by 811D of the USCSA as the Attorney General DEA are. Again, the issue is not with violence violating the treaty, it's with violating an act of Congress, apparently. This is what's in the way, an act of Congress. How do we get rid of this? I don't know if you know, let me know in the Congress, or no, let me know in the comments, <laughs> or if you have any proposed solution. So in the meantime, if this is the case, the Cole Memo 2.0 or Garland Memo 2.0 actually looks a bit more promising because we know government never works quickly. And sadly, like I say this all the time, I know it's annoying, but we'll have to wait and see. And we just never want to hold our breath for government to do the right thing because we never expect the DA to do anything positive for cannabis reform. And so while I have you on this topic, a little bit of a history lesson. This is an analysis done by two researchers revisiting the 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs. So you can pause to read this abstract for a brief summary, but main thing to highlight if we go down to the bottom, uh, conclusions consequently after 50 years, basically saying that, yeah, we need to revisit this because it doesn't apply to a lot of what we've learned uh, based on a lot of past fears that made this implemented in the first place. And so with that, a bit of a history lesson on from encyclopedia.com on Harry J. Anslinger, the asshole that created the status quo around cannabis that we have now. I'm just going to scroll down. Obviously, these links will be below if you wanted to read through it, but the international drug policy, just to highlight that, that it was this man responsible for all of this for the most part. So you can pause to read the top part, but this is where it gets interesting. As Anslinger's annual bureau reports to the U.S. Treasury Committee were also submitted as his official annual reports to the League Opium Advisory Committee and its successor, the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which apparently gets to determine what drug belongs in which section or schedule of the CSA. He could thus push his views in the U.S. as recommendations endorsed by the international bodies, using the UN as a tool to enforce his personal views on Americans regarding cannabis, simultaneously using that tool to present them as latter or official statements of US positions. Absolutely disgusting and straight criminal. And then leads to this last part. After the war, he was the leading proponent of a single convention finally approved in 1961 after 10 years of drafting. It incorporated much of the US law enforcement orientation that is still in play today, the status quo, that if we write this one pass wrong, we can solve so many issues, including obligations upon members to control crops and production to standardize identification and packaging, and to impose severe criminal penalties on drug offenders. Sound familiar? Sadly, common practice still around the globe. So if we could write this one man's past wrongs, man, what a better world we could have. Yet Anslinger's perspective seems to live on, but this perfect quote encapsulates it at the end. Anslinger may indeed have been, a critical, as critical congressman John M. Coffey labeled him in 1938, far and away the costliest man in the world not only for human life, but the money wasted on the failed war on drugs, absolutely unbelievable. So a bit more here if you just wanted to pause read. Obviously, this is Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt, but just relaying a lot of what I uh, just taught you all. And so yeah, one of the worst men in history, Harry J. Anslinger, you heard it here first. And so thanks, Mike, in the morning, back to cannabis for sharing this. Democracy reality check, nearly the same number of people voted against SQ820 as they did against medical cannabis in 2018. But what was the main difference? Uh, the number of supporters dropped from 507K in 2018 to 216 in 2023. And so rural voters didn't kill rec cannabis. It was apathy among supporters or lack of interest among supporters who didn't show up this time around that showed up the first time around that sadly uh, caused Oklahoma to not get adult use. And so thank you for pointing this out, Mike. Uh, very interesting. And so these are the, the photos that back up what he's claiming. Well, that does suck for Oklahoma. Good to see other states are not dragging their feet. As MJ Biz Daily shares, recent updates, Hawaii and Delaware did recently pass legislation through their chambers. Adult use cannabis legislation or legalization outlook is much rosier there after Oklahoma failure. And so while one state fails, we see two others succeed. 
love to see it. And so I invite you to pause to read. I'm not going to spend too much time going through this whole thing. I invite you to grab the link below if you wanted to read through it. Uh, otherwise, you can pause to read as well to learn more about what is happening in Hawaii and Delaware. And with that, I have some more news on Delaware's um, bill. So I'll le leave it here so you can pause to read as well. But Marijuana Moment shares Delaware House approves cannabis sales bill days after passing complementary legalization measures. So I believe it usually goes from the Senate back to the House, then back through for a few more revisions before getting signed by a governor or whoever. Um, and so good news, the chamber cleared the regulatory legislation from Rep. O Ed Ozienski, which advanced through two committees before reaching the floor in a 27 to 13 vote. And so while they've been trying for a long time, Osienski is supporting both the simple legalization bill HB1 and the sales measure HB2. Now keep in mind it is early, these can change, but just figured I would share what, uh, what HB1 has to offer so far. Pause to read and then HB2 uh, regulatory bill so far. And so remember, this is Delaware, another small state like Oklahoma would have been, but obviously still the more states that reform their laws, the better ultimately. And so with that, uh, just an update out of Maryland. Thanks, Tom Engel, for sharing. The Maryland House of Delegates passed a bill to create a regulatory framework for cannabis sales following voters' approval of a legalization ballot referendum. As, and as well, so Maryland voted to legalize at the same time as Missouri on the November 2022 ballot. We know Missouri has already launched their program, saw 100 million sales in their first month, and they're crushing it. Maryland looking a little bit more to do the leftist angle focusing on social equity. Fair enough, it's taking you longer. No doubt we can already see that, um, but hopefully they can get this uh, done on schedule by July 1st, 2023 and launch their program then. And as always, you can grab the link below in the description if you wanted to read through it. And so with that, on to Air Wellness as they report their fourth quarter and full year 2022 results. And so I invite you to pause to read if you're interested. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but as an Air Wellness shareholder, I should mention that while I'm not necessarily disappointed because this was to be expected, this is all you can do when a state like New Jersey with 8 million people only opens 18 legal dispensaries, so you can barely compete with the black market and you know only allows MSOs to operate two or three. You can only grow sales by so much. And so as more states reform their laws, I do think Air Wellness can survive in the long run. They have enough cash to pay off their debt and hopefully, you know, they'll be able to become cash flow positive, cut costs and turn some of that revenue, uh, you know, into gross profit. But again, just sharing my perspective as an Air Wellness shareholder. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, not advice, just how I, or just how I feel about them as an owner at around $6 Canadian. And now they're at a dollar Canadian, but still super cheap market cap relative to the potential if they can turn things around. And so with that fourth quarter financial summary uh, and full year 2022 financial summary. So you can pause to read but when you consider, again, the company's not cash flow positive, but their market cap is under a hundred million dollars right now and the revenue full year 2022 465 million so again operating loss of 243 but if they can turn that around obviously i'm hopeful um but just sharing my thoughts and so with that fourth quarter and recent highlights retail updates brand product updates corporate updates pause to read if you're interested full year 2022 highlights pause to read if you're interested and then financing capital structure and their potential outlook for the rest of the year. And so again, wise to take with a grain of salt. And while these have been wrong in the past, I still hold my investment in air. I have it at about $6 Canadian. And so while I'm way down, I'm not going to sell for loss because again, we've seen this industry less focused on fundamentals and technicals, really just legislative news and the big cycles and catalysts. And so again, we might get one at the end of March. We might not, but I'm holding as if we will. And so with that, Can Investments, thank you for sharing this summary, uh, more financial focused. Uh, so if you wanted to go through this, I encourage you to do it on air wellness while showing some margin improvements in Q4. Uh, Air largely continues to struggle in achieving profitability cash flow as elevated OPEX and heavy liabilities have forced their hand to cancel deals and exit states while they focus on core states that are making the money uh, right now. And so further improvement needed for sure. But again, thank you, Can Investments, for, for writing this out and sharing it publicly so that I can share it with my audience as it's definitely more of the financial deep dive that I imagine you guys would like to get. And with that one, he's also got one from TrueLeave. Uh, I featured TrueLeave's recent earnings in my last video, but this is more of a deep dive on that as well if you're interested. So thanks, Can Investments. Q4 from TrueLeave, largely below expectations with market price compression, inventory management, and right sizing of capacity capacity, limiting top line growth and squeezing margins. So different problems than what Air is having. So worth noting, but initial steps towards better cash flow management were visible in Q4, but more needed in 2023. And so thank you again, Can Investments. Uh, this is more on, uh, on Trulieve's most recent uh, earnings. And then you can grab the link in the description for my video for last week as well. And so with that, thank you Hartford Business for sharing this one. Six social equity retailers, or another way of just saying this, six entrepreneurs backed by Chicago Cannabis Company get a green light. Yay. We love to see, it seems to be the MSOs actually helping entrepreneurs or social, or social equity retailers get the start in certain markets that they've been waiting for for a long time. And so while I don't want to spend too much time on this, just wanted to highlight Verano again, putting their money where their mouth is and actually helping, you know, smaller entrepreneurs get off the ground versus what all the regulators and all these states claim to be doing by their bad policy. And so grab the link below if you wanted to read. Otherwise, you can pause to read just for a snippet to see how they are helping these six entrepreneurs get a kickstart in, in Connecticut.
And so with that, um, while Verano was helping the social equity entrepreneurs, here is the irony as Jeremy, Jeremy Burke, thank you for sharing this one from F sfgate.com. Jay-Z's monogram cannabis brand illegally shipped pot from California to New York, apparently, breaking the law, filed inaccurate financial reports, and engaged in gender discrimination. So much for the most socially equity-focused uh, cannabis single-state operator in the biz, a new lawsuit alleges. And so, um, yeah, you, you can't make this shit up. And so we've got Verano actually helping social equity entrepreneurs facing all the backlash from propagandists trying to say that these MSOs are just in it for the business versus a company that put an artist's name on the brand simply to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it seems like Everything they've done is the opposite of that. And so you cannot make this shit up. Skin color doesn't matter, man. It's your fucking character. And so with that, connoisseurs.io wanted to share this one. Connecticut cannabis market trends, sales growing week over week and month over month, which we do like to see. While adult use versus medical share has not changed. Very interesting because that's a market unique where we see others a lot of the times rec sales increase where meds decrease, where med sales decrease. Average adult use product price down by 10%. Uh, it appears to be converging with average medical sales price as well. And so again, an another interesting market. And the source is apparently data got data.ct.gov. So I'll put that link below, um, but an interesting visual if you just wanted to pause to read. So thank you again, connoisseurs.io, for this interesting visual. Well, we've got news from Pennsylvania, so thanks, Tom Engel, for sharing this. PA Governor Josh Shapiro is proposing to legalize cannabis as part of his budget request, projecting the state would generate $188 million in annual revenue from cannabis by 2028 alone. So yes, obviously, sooner than later, PA, get this going, uh, while several lawmakers in the meantime are preparing legalization bills. And so more on this if you wanted to read about PA, but we'll keep you updated, and hopefully this does come true sooner than later. And so with that, Office of Medical Cannabis Use for this past week, we look at dispensaries open from the week of March 6th to the 10th. We see one from Insa open in Largo, Jungle Boys in Palm Harbor, Sunnyside in Palm Harbor, and then True Leave in Palatka. If we look at the qualified patient count, um, they increase the number to 797,505, which represents a week over increase of 2,000, or week over week increase, sorry, 2,726 patients. So good to see that number back up over the 2,500 mark as more people want access to a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And so with that, we've got dispensations from March 3rd to the 9th, all of the active MSOs in the state, the number of dispensary locations, milligrams of THC sold this past week, milligrams of CBD sold, and ounces in smokable flour. And so all the data is here if you want to keep track week over week. But of course, as our friend Pierre Gilles on Twitter uh, provides the Florida comp sheet and the THC market share comp sheet, uh, I will provide those in the, the comments once he updates those because I don't believe he's updated them yet. Um, and so with that, Pink Horse Capital, thank you for sharing. In relation to the 60% threshold of the Florida adult use ballot passing, Kim River said, current adult use cannabis is polling over 70% as well. So that's huge. Uh, for the for the future and fate of adult use in Florida coming sooner than later. So have a high level of confidence as it relates to acceptance by the people of the language and of adult use cannabis in general in the state. The statement gives a boost in confidence on Florida legislation passing as we were skeptical given the 60% mark in AU history in red states uh, like Oklahoma, but polls are only so accurate that there's still a large risk of this flopping, but to us the statement raises the odds of AU passing in Florida. And most importantly though, as we saw, apathy cannot get in the way. We want to make sure that those who supported medical in Florida originally also come out to support rec because that's clearly what we saw being the big factor in Oklahoma. And so last few stories, Texas lawmakers passed cannabis decriminalization bill. And so love to see this through Texas. Decriminalization is great. No one should go to jail for a plant, but at the same time, this just facilitates organized crime, sadly. And so um, if passed though, so again, um, it's passing through, I imagine the house first still has many chambers to go through, but if passed, legislation would remove criminal penalties for the possession of up to one ounce of cannabis or cannabis concentrate. Such possession would be reclassified as a Class C misdemeanor, a citable offense not subject to arrest and carrying a fine of up to 500. And so, as opposed to criminalizing, now we just get to fine you and take more, more money from you that you might not even have. Don't know if that's even better than, I mean, obviously it's better than throwing people in jail, but at the same time, uh, better to launch an adult use program to, to offset the black market that is undoubtedly going to try and run rampant when you decriminalize and no longer criminalize. And so, Steps in the right direction, though. Uh, more on this if you wanted to read the link below. And saddened by this news, thank you, Cannabis Health, for sharing. Um, but RIP, rest in peace to the father of cannabis research professor, Raphael Mechelum. If you don't know who he is, consider maybe you know spending some time to look him up, but he's, he's an OG. Throughout his 60-year career, Mechelum has pioneered cannabis research. He was the one that found the CB1 receptor, the CB2 receptor, the endocannabinoid system, all of that. And so helping to identify and explore hundreds of cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system itself, a system that so many people are still very very uneducated about unaware that it's even a thing. And so um, kudos to you for starting what you've done, uh, Professor Raphael Mechelum. Rest in peace, good sir. And hopefully others can carry the torch as we deschedule and find the medical benefits of this plant. So with that, this one from Wiley Online Library, another study worth noting, a novel mechanism of cannabis oil in suppressing ovarian cancer through LAIR1 mediated mitochondrial dysfunction and 
apoptosis. And so, so you can pause to read the abstract, but get this. In summary, the present findings confirm that CBD inhibits ovarian cell growth. Damn, I imagine every woman wants access to free cannabis if she's ever concerned that her ovarian cells might be under threat by cancer cells. Just saying. And so last story, Cannabis Tech, and today wanted to share this out of Spain. Spain to quadruple legal medical cannabis production by this year. So love to hear it. Um, and apparently that means that they're going to increase production to 23.43 tons of medical cannabis in Spain this year. Why it's not enough? Well, if it's not enough, then why don't you increase it to eight times or 12 times? Just make it an amount so that it's enough. I don't understand why they wouldn't you know, do that. But anyways, obviously you can pause to read for a little bit more humor out of how governments just cannot work in common sense. Um, a bit more down here if you wanted to pause to read and a boost for reform effort. So while this is just a start out of Spain, hopefully this could lead to more. But of course, we're holding out uh, for Germany by the end of this month, March, to introduce their adult use legislation. Not to pass it, but in to introduce it, hopefully set some waves through the industry as this is can big cannabis news out of Europe. Um, and if that could be in line with what we saw at the beginning, the introduction of some sort of safe legislation, that could be the massive catalyst that we've been holding out for. Again, I don't know, take it with a grain of salt. Don't hate me if I'm wrong, but just trying to, again, relay what is happening in this industry as best as possible so that we can take advantage and we can capitalize and get paid eventually by uh, righting the past wrongs and changing the status quo for the better. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Wednesday for this week or for a midweek update in the world of cannabis. Have a great weekend, everybody.